Did you know that Boeing actually missed the chance to buy the Bombardier aircraft that we now know as the Airbus A220? How <laughs> did they do that? And what would the airliner market look like today if that aircraft would have become the Boeing 797 instead of the Airbus A220? Stay tuned. On the surface, the story about the Airbus A220 and the dealings between Boeing and Airbus and Bombardier look about as interesting as they are straightforward. Basically, Bombardier designed the new aircraft, which they chose to name the C-Series, and then Boeing made a trade complaint about price dumping and subsidies. This in turn led Bombardier to join forces with Airbus, who eventually bought a majority stake in the aircraft design and turned it into the Airbus A220. That sounds pretty simple, right? I'm sure many of you have heard some variation of this story before, but this brief description that I just gave you doesn't even come close to explaining what actually happened here. This story was a huge missed opportunity for Boeing, and is something that I think that they're likely still grinding their teeth about. They actually got incredibly close to getting the C-Series into their own aircraft lineup, and in fact, in some ways, it would probably have been easier for Boeing to absorb it into their lineup than it eventually became for Airbus. So let's have a look at what really happened, and starting with what the C-Series or the Airbus A220 really is and what it isn't. Fair warning, I will be using the term C-Series and Airbus A220 interchangeably in this video, because they're really the same thing. The C-Series is a modern, very efficient aircraft that is in actually quite high demand from a lot of different airlines, and there are good reasons for that. It's also an aircraft that had a really troubled birth, and it actually came close to getting cancelled quite a few times. What the C-Series is not is a regional jet, although many people, including some in the aviation industry, really thought that it was when it was being developed. Bombardier would eventually develop two versions of the C-Series, known as the CS-100 and the CS-300, which are now known as the Airbus 220-100 and the Airbus 220-300. The smaller variant of the aircraft seats between 100 to 120 passengers, while the larger version seats 120 to 145. But the emergency exit limits for both versions are even higher, so they could carry more. It features a 5 per row seating, which is very similar to what the MD-80 and the Fokker 100 does, for example. And it was actually those kind of aircraft, including the smaller versions of the Boeing 737, that Bombardier built the C-Series to replace. This new aircraft used fly-by-wire and modern avionics, along with advanced lightweight materials and a very efficient Pratt & Whitney geared turbofan, to make it more than 25% more efficient than some of those older designs. And in fact, it even became a bit more efficient than the Boeing 737 MAX and the Airbus A320neo families, and that's worth remembering for what's to come. Bombardier launched the C-Series in 2008 with Lufthansa as a launch customer, and crucially, at the time, Bombardier estimated that the development cost would end up around $2.1 billion, and that's a rather suspiciously low number. Although it might be possible that this initial estimate didn't include some additional costs. Because by the time Airbus got involved, after the aircraft had entered service, the actual cost of the program had climbed to 7 billion US dollars. Some of this money had come from the Canadian government and the government of the Quebec province, both in the forms of loans and as public investment. Of course, both Boeing and Airbus were well aware of this new aircraft being developed, but Boeing in particular didn't think much of the project at all, until in 2016. Because in April that year, Bombardier and Delta Airlines announced a deal for the purchase of 75 CS100s plus another 50 as options. Delta was going to use these jets to replace the 737-700s, the MD-88s and the MD-90s, and later on some of these orders were also changed over to the larger CS300 variant. Boeing was shocked by this, because they had been hoping to get that order for Delta for their 737 Maxes. Boeing reacted extremely strongly and immediately. They filed a complaint with the US International Trade Commission, accusing Bombardier of price dumping, meaning that it was selling the aircraft at a loss. The complaint also claimed that the Canadian authorities had subsidized the program illegally. Now, before we go any further, it should be mentioned that it is not uncommon for early sales of brand new designs to be 
steeply discounted, especially when it comes to large orders from key customers, like for example in the case of your very first US customer. Also, the Canadian government's support for the program was public knowledge, and again, much of it was in the form of an investment, but we'll get back to that. But the point here is that if Boeing believed that they would be able to kill this program by forcing unrealistic import duties on it, they were wrong. Not only were Boeing's trade complaints eventually overturned, but by these actions they basically drove Bombardier and the C-Series towards Airbus. No orders were cancelled, and the rest, as they say, is history. Or is it? Well, no, not really, because this doesn't tell us why Boeing ignored the C-Series before its order from Delta, or how easily things could have gone in Boeing's favour, and I will tell you all about that after this short message from my sponsor, who makes it possible for me to make this kind of videos. One of my goals for 2023 is to try to improve the weaker areas of my personality, and thanks to today's sponsor, Blinkist, I'm already starting to work on that. Blinkist is a platform that explains essential concepts from over 5,500 non-fictional books and podcasts in just around 15 minutes. Through tailored content and personality-driven experiences, Blinkist is helping me to reach my 2023 goals of becoming a better parent, a smarter communicator, and hopefully a more impactful leader. Just recently, I listened to The Hidden Psychology of Social Networks by Joe Federer, Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield, and Leading from Anywhere by David Burkus. The last one is basically a guide on how to lead a remote team efficiently, which is something that I try to do with my team all the time. Right now, Blinkist also has a new feature called Blinkist Connect, which allows every Blinkist Premium user to share their plan with another account without any extra cost, which is perfect for me and Sandra. Become who you want to be this year and start by scanning this QR code or click on the link in the description below. That will give you a 7-day free trial and then 25% off the premium subscription, which you can then share with a loved one. Thank you Blinkist, now back to the video. Now, to understand Boeing's previous position on the C-Series program, we need to talk about how Boeing viewed the market for single-aisle aircraft at the time. Scott Hamilton has analyzed this story extensively in Leham News, which I highly recommend you to check out. We'll link to it here in the description. Boeing stopped their own production of the 717 in 2006. That's two years before Bombardier launched the C-Series. This meant that after this cancellation, the 737 would be Boeing's smallest aircraft. Now, of course, Boeing knew that the operators of the 717 and the MD-80 would eventually need to replace those aircraft. But Simplistically speaking, Boeing could reasonably expect operators of these jets, including Delta, to upgauge their fleet, meaning that they would move over to a slightly bigger aircraft like the 737 MAX 7, for example. Given the much better fuel efficiency of the 737 MAX, it would have a lower trip cost than those older, smaller jets, so Boeing thought that it had a perfect replacement for the Mad Dog fleets. Plus, most prospective customers would likely then also order the larger 737s with the same pilot type rating, so fleet commonality was also favoring the 737 MAX. But it's worth noting here that Delta had no 737 MAX orders at the time that this deal took place. And the C-Series? Well, Boeing got a first indication that it had severely underestimated Bombardier's new jet before the Delta order, when United Airlines also nearly ordered the C-Series, and after that came the Delta bombshell. Now, this might be a slight oversimplification, but it appears that Boeing viewed the C-Series as an overgrown regional aircraft, basically something for countries without the scope clause rules that affect the regionals in the US. So Boeing basically thought that the C-Series would be competing with Embraer's E-2 series, but not its own larger aircraft. Embraer's E-Series were indeed among Bombardier's targets, but that's beside the point. Fundamentally, what Bombardier wanted with the C-Series project was an aircraft that would be ideal for the huge distances and peculiarities of operating in Canada. This meant that it needed to be able to operate from small regional airports with relatively short runways and some other infrastructure limitations. This ability to serve remote communities in Canada was actually the reason why the Canadian government had invested in the aircraft in the first place. And that's why its support to the program was, as far as they were concerned, completely legal. 
But like I mentioned, to serve these remote communities properly, this plane also needed to be able to cover reasonably long distances. And that meant that the C-Series would need to be developed as a single aisle medium haul airliner. The range of the larger CS300 or the Airbus A220-300 today is 3600 nautical miles, which means that it has essentially the same range as the 737 MAX or the Airbus A320neo. More importantly, Bombardier designed the wing of the C-Series with a future fuselage stretch in mind. This longer model, then called the CS500, is now referred to as the Airbus A220-500 and would be able to compete directly with the 737 MAX 8. Introducing that model will involve getting a little bit more power out of its current engines, but that's not an insurmountable obstacle. The point here is that it looks like Boeing miscalculated the potential of this aircraft very badly. Today, Breeze Airways is even talking to Airbus about adding extra fuel tanks to its Airbus A220-300 to give the plane a 4,000 nautical mile range, enough for flights from the United States to South America or even to Europe. So it's definitely not the regional jet. But for Boeing, this story isn't just a miscalculation, it's very much a lost opportunity. Bombardier had struggled financially with the C-Series almost from the beginning and crucially they had actually approached Boeing before the Delta order came through to discuss a possible collaboration but Boeing declined at that point. Then after Boeing complained about the Delta order to the US International Trade Commission, Bombardier, Boeing and the Canadian government entered into high level discussions about the potential partnership which would see Boeing getting an ownership stake in the C-Series aircraft. But then for some unknown reason, Boeing, on its own initiative, broke off these discussions and instead pressed on with their previous trade complaint. And a few weeks after that, the US International Trade Commission made its initial decision to uphold Boeing's complaint and imposed duties and tariffs of 300%, essentially making it impossible for Bombardier to sell its jets in the United States. But then along came Airbus and with it yet another Boeing miscalculation. Unlike the American manufacturer, Airbus had seen the C-Series for the excellent jet that it actually was. They had also been in talks with Bombardier about a possible tie-up before Boeing filed their trade complaint. With Boeing's actions now actually threatening the program's existence, Bombardier and the Canadian authorities agreed to sell a controlling stake of the C-Series to Airbus and that's what finally turned the aircraft from the C-Series to the Airbus A220. The European aircraft maker then quickly announced that it would open an assembly line for the newly renamed Airbus A220 in the same Alabama facility where it was already assembling its Airbus A320s. And here comes the kicker. Airbus reportedly didn't have to pay any cash or assume any debt in this deal, at least not for its initial 50.01% controlling stake. But of course, the European manufacturer did have to invest in other ways by, for example, setting up the production line in Alabama. And later, in 2020, Airbus then bought Bombardier's remaining stake in the program and continued to invest even more into its building infrastructure. But if you compare these costs with what it would cost to develop and certify a clean sheet design of this quality, well, then Airbus basically got the C-Series for nothing. And if Boeing had hoped that duties and tariffs would keep the aircraft away from the US market, it was also sadly mistaken. Because in February 2018, the US International Trade Commission reversed its previous decision, agreeing that there was no threat to the US aviation industry from the C-Series. Airbus had received its controlling stake in the program three months before this decision. In addition to these missed opportunities, it's also worth noting here that Boeing's behavior in this story really pissed off a lot of people in Canada. Developing the C-Series had become a matter of national pride and the program had already survived a lot of obstacles, cancellation scares and political and other tensions. So seeing the program threatened by Boeing after all of that, well, let's just say that it didn't gain Boeing any fans in Canada. And that might possibly also have played a role in Boeing being eliminated from a contract for a new fighter jet for the Canadian Air Force in November last year. Because before the trade complaint in 2017, many analysts saw the Boeing F-18 Super Hornet as the favorite for Canada's new fighter jet program. The other favorite option, the Lockheed Martin F-35, was seen as just too costly. 
But soon after Boeing's trade complaint, officials in Canada said very bluntly that the country would look less favorably on a fighter bid from a company that had harmed Canada's national interests. Now here's an interesting question. What would have happened if Boeing had been a little bit more diplomatic with Bombardier and maybe gotten a controlling stake in the aircraft instead of Airbus? Well, obviously here we're going to have to be a little bit speculative, which is always fun. So at the time, Boeing had already decided to go ahead with the re-engine 737 that we now call the MAX. That was well before the Delta C series order. So that program would have gone ahead anyway. And with the MAX about to enter the market, if Boeing also owned the C-Series, any support behind that aircraft would likely start to cannibalize the smallest MAX variant, the MAX 7, right? Now, that might sound bad at the onset, but that's only until you realize that the MAX 7 isn't really selling much at all. Even Southwest, which is its main buyer, has switched many of their orders over to the larger 737-8 instead. So, if Boeing would have had the C-Series as an excellent, efficient, new, small, single-aisle aircraft, hypothetically, maybe called the 797, they could still sell the 737 8, 9 and 10 models of the MAX and let the C-Series handle the smaller aircraft segment. And then later, when the sales of the 737 would begin to decline, which they inevitably will, they could introduce the stretched version of the uh, C-Series, the 500, and call it, let's say, the 797-5. That aircraft would then replace the 737 MAX 8, and meanwhile, since that stretch would cost Boeing very little to do, they could then devote all of their design efforts on the new mid-sized airplane, the NMA, which would sit between the 737 and the 787. If they would have had these three variants of the C-Series, or 797, in service, it would potentially have allowed Boeing to design the NMA to fill the roles of the old 757 and 767, and when the time came, also the largest 737 MAX variants. That would let the 737 potentially finally retire without a hole in the Boeing aircraft lineup. Now, that's just an idea, but it does sound like quite a good one, doesn't it? Now, it is worth mentioning here that fitting the C-Series into the lineup is a problem for Airbus as well. The A220-300 is already eating into the sales of the A319neo, which has hardly got any orders at all. And today, even the Airbus A320neo is only getting a fraction of the sales of the larger 321neo. Airbus could easily launch the longer A220-500, which would completely sideline the Airbus 320neo. But with Boeing announcing that it won't develop any new aircraft soon, Airbus has no real reason to hurry. Finally, it's also worth pointing out that even though the A220 is an awesome aircraft with quite a few sales, Airbus has been struggling to make it as profitable as the rest of the single-aisle aircraft. Now, with its fly-by-wire and side sticks, the A220 may look like it's closer to Airbus's way of designing aircraft, but in terms of its manufacturing, the A220 is a North American jet with mostly North American supply chain. I say mostly because its wings are actually made in Belfast, Northern Ireland. The point here is that it would have been much easier for Boeing to handle and streamline the supply chain of the C-Series than it actually is for Airbus. Even that wing operation in Northern Ireland now belongs to Spirit Aerosystems, which is a key Boeing supplier. So to summarize, Boeing's miscalculations with the C-Series made it lose a part of the market. It gave more strength than basically a free aircraft to Airbus, and it really pissed off a lot of Canadians. Now, I know that the world of commercial aviation can often be quite cutthroat and dirty, which is completely normal with the enormous amount of money that are involved. But if you play that game, you might also lose out on great opportunities. I am personally just happy to see that the Airbus A220 continues to exist and that it thrives, because I love that aircraft and I would love to fly it if I was given the chance. Now, check out this video next, which I really think that you're going to like, or this playlist. If you want to support the work that we do here on the channel, which I really hope you do, then consider becoming part of my lovely Patreon crew. And you can take part in my next weekly hangout. I'd love to see you there. Have an absolutely fantastic day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.